Today on the podcast, we're continuing our story of Disney designer Herb Ryman. We're not quite up to the final episode in this series, but we are close. When we left off last time, Ryman had been laid off from WED shortly before Disney World opened. Despite being laid off, though, he booked a flight at his own expense and traveled to Florida for the opening so he could see the park in person. Many friends were happy to see him there, though a few managers, those who had approved his departure, were somewhat uncomfortable to find him on Main Street and at after-hours parties for designers. Still, Ryman accepted the situation as best he could, a departure from Walt's design company where he had worked for 18 years, more or less, since WED had been formed. And that is where we pick up our story today, as Ryman plans a life for himself after Disney, a life that would move him back through many of his early life experiences. And so, if you're ready to drop back down into the life of this key Disney designer, here we go. Now that Ryman was no longer employed by WED, his future again opened to him in ways he didn't expect. He walked through Disney World observing all of the projects he had helped design, projects now arranged with wood, steel, and cement. He spent time with his sister Lucille and her husband John Carroll in St. Petersburg, Florida, where they had a house and planned to live at least for a little while. Then Ryman did what he often did when he left a job at a studio. He booked travel, packed up his pens and brushes, and focused on paintings he wanted to create. In the fall of 1971, likely late October through December, Ryman toured Europe with the goal of creating paintings to present in galleries. In October 1971, I began another world odyssey. He said, I was off once again to visit the magnificent cities on the opposite side of the Atlantic. These places made a great impact on me. Every day, every week, I had my paints, I had my watercolors, I had my pen and ink and sketchbooks. I continued to draw and record the captivating memories and experiences influencing my life. I wanted to remember forever the exact times and locations. Ryman spent weeks in Italy, Spain, and France, reacquainting himself with cities he had visited when young. He painted the Roman Forum and the Temple of Romulus. He painted the River Seine, moving beneath the bridge at Point Neuf, the current touched with notes of yellow and brick. He brushed out the rooftops of Florence with the winter sun lightly reflecting off the terracotta tiles. He presented the Vatican Garden with layers of green, each one darker than the next, as though the trees hid ancient secrets just beyond the city. His approach to painting now was different than it had been when he had visited Europe as a young man. In the 1930s, he both drew and painted individuals in an attempt to present the culture of these countries through images of the people who lived there. Often deeply detailed sketches of individuals, often men focused on their work. This had been the influence of art school, the endless life drawing classes. Now, however, his paintings were focused almost solely on place. He had changed as an artist. Over decades, the studios and WED had convinced him that his great strength was in communicating emotion through the presentation of an environment. In his drawings and paintings now, people, when they were pictured, were little more than quick brush strokes to create clothes, artful smudges of flesh-colored paint to suggest a face. One painting, made in Spain, featured a carriage driver and his horse. The man's head turned so that viewers could only see the back of his head and one ear. This had been his style at WED, when he'd created themed lands and fair pavilions in which anyone could easily imagine their way into the painting, visitors to places that were only then being planned. 
Ryman's effort to elevate the presentation of space over people is perhaps best observed in a sketch he made on this trip of a policeman walking beside the set. The sketch was produced with pen and Conti crayon. The policeman, with his back to viewers, walks alone toward the Notre Dame Cathedral. He is dressed in a flat cap, a knee-length cape, and pants that narrow down to boots. Viewers see him from behind, the cape draped in thin pleats down from his shoulders, the back of his neatly clipped hair, and the tilt of his head as though he has just spotted something of interest ahead. Viewers aren't asked to consider the life of the policeman or even his personality, but rather to follow him as he walks beside the river, moving past buildings many centuries old towards something that compels him a little ways down the path. Even Ryman understood how much his art had changed from the late 1930s to the early 1970s. He only needed to compare his own paintings and drawings from his first trip to those he now produced. Many sketches from the 1930s included people or perhaps were wholly focused on them. The subjects didn't typically look at viewers, but rather often glanced just to the right or left of them, not making eye contact but suggesting that through art they inhabited the same space as those in a gallery. His paintings and sketches from the early 1970s were almost wholly the presentation of a city, a field, or a road moving into the country. Ryman was now a designer of space, both for the movies and theme parks, and also an artist who explored landscapes in his personal work. As he grew older, he found people difficult to know, including his sisters, who, after his mother's death, became more manipulative. Beyond this, though, he had dated many women, though none of these relationships had expanded into marriage. If Ryman was drawn to the subject of humanity as he was early in life, it was largely people at work. Ryman had painted fishermen, admiring their albacore catch, a priest studying his holy book and circus performers waiting to step into the big top. Work was how he understood his own life. He was a person who for years had been defined by his abilities with a brush and pen. His closest friendships were arranged around work, more so than they were around other social activities. When Ryman had returned from his world travels in the late 1930s, he brought home a stack of paintings and drawings ideally suited for gallery shows. But he knew that his experiences had a secondary value. If he wasn't able to launch himself as a gallery artist, he could draw upon his travels to deepen the realism and the authenticity of the sets he created for live-action films, which is ultimately what he did both at MGM and later at Fox. He created feature film sets for stories that took place in Europe and China. When he returned to California in 1972, however, he knew that that version of Hollywood had fallen away years ago. Starting in the 1960s, cameras moved out from studio lots and focused their lenses on real-world locations, which was a trend that increased in the early 1970s. The majority of The Godfather, for example, was filmed on locations in New York. Another blockbuster shot that year, Deliverance, was filmed largely in northern Georgia. Even comedies, which back in the 1930s and 1940s would have been entirely shot on a studio lot, were now filmed in real-world locations. Many scenes in What's Up, Doc were shot in San Francisco and Los Angeles. Backlots were now more often used for TV productions, such as westerns and sitcoms, than they were for feature films. Though studios still shot some films on their lot, Work for serious features was more often accomplished off the lot to create a sense of heightened reality. In short, Ryman no longer had his old fallback career, his ability to transform his skills as a landscape artist into the profession of set design.
In California, he continued to work on his paintings in his home studio, a grand room with high ceilings and a wide north-facing window that let in natural light. The room, which at one point had been a combination bedroom, office, and studio, was at the moment entirely situated to assist with Ryman's work. Paintings were arranged on the walls, an eight-foot easel stood in the center of the room tall enough for large canvases. Beside the easel was a long table covered with paint tubes, pins, and a terracotta gardening pot that had been repurposed to hold a couple dozen brushes. As had been his practice all his life, once home, Ryman developed new paintings based on sketches he had made while traveling. When taken with restlessness or the need to abandon the city, Ryman would drive north following the 101 to the coastal highway, which took him to the property he owned just outside Carmel. This part of the central California coast was his other source of inspiration, a piece of the natural world that he tried to capture in paintings and drawings. Once there, he visited tide pools, he examined starfish and barnacles, he drew otters as they moved through the surf, he spent hours studying sea lions, pelicans, sandpipers, and gulls. It was here where he felt most connected with the world, far beyond the Studios, the untouched wonder of the beach that stretched back centuries, spiraling through the folds of time. Just as after his two previous high periods of work on his own canvases, those years after his travels in the late 1930s, and the years after his time with the Ringling Brothers, Ryman looked to galleries and museums to show his work once he had finished dozens of canvases. The first of his big shows was in Palm Springs, an exhibition that lasted three weeks with his work presented in the Desert Museum. The show, which included a member's preview and reception, featured paintings from all stages of Ryman's career, from Europe to Asia, from the studios to the circus, from Maine to the rocky coastline of Big Sur. Ryman attended the opening night on April 23, 1973, where before a small crowd, he talked about his life and work. That show, presented under the name The Visual Versatile World of Herbert Ryman, then traveled to Ryman's hometown, Decatur, Illinois, where it opened on November 4th at the Kirkland Fine Arts Gallery with 40 paintings. On that first day, the exhibit was attended by 500 people. Also on its first day, eight of those 40 paintings were sold. By the time the exhibit closed, Ryman sold 16. From there, Ryman was invited to show his work in London. Beyond solo shows, his paintings were exhibited individually in and around Los Angeles, where they were viewed by, among others, those who had worked with Ryman at WED. Through these paintings, some of his old friends came to better understand Herbie. After viewing Ryman's recent work, Disney sculptor Blaine Gibson said, his landscapes were just out of this world. He seemed to get more emotion in them. But Gibson also saw that Ryman's portraits didn't have this same intensity. Gibson believed that the portraits were filled with a technical virtuosity, but also the virtuosity of these paintings exceeded their emotional content, particularly when he got into the human form. Gibson thought the portraits lacked the immediacy and interest found in the landscapes, and this ultimately was the mark of Ryman's genius, a brilliance that simply wasn't in step with contemporary trends in serious art. Decades earlier, back in art school, Ryman had wanted to paint in the manner of early 20th century masters, not the cerebral modernists or the avant-garde postmodernists, though Ryman's canvases were a mix of realism and personal style. He valued realism over style. 
His landscapes were realistic efforts shaped by emotion. When he started with the studios and later with WED, he found unique connections to those sets and themed areas he designed, again creating believable images of places that didn't yet exist or hadn't existed for a while, images that then were layered with tones of wonder and awe. At MGM, he found his way into the courtyards of 18th century Paris and the streets of 19th century London. At Disney, he found his way into turn-of-the-century America and into a realm of fantasy. His imagination was most alive when it was focused on environment, not people. As solace for him came more from place than from friends. This ultimately was Ryman's greatest artistic gift to capture a place either real or imagined with his brush so that it radiated a mood, a vibe, a bristling sense of emotion. During the mid-1970s, Ryman's personal work developed a small following, both in art communities and in the growing community of Disney fans, a group that quickly developed after the passing of Walt and Roy. A number of Disney fans were interested in paintings that Ryman produced on his own, as though his personal work might give them a stronger understanding as to how the parks had been designed in California and in Florida. Ryman sold originals, but now he sold lithographs as well, which proved lucrative. As his work began to make money, his sisters, particularly Lucille, oversaw his business. Ryman himself was never good with business. He was not good at negotiations, nor was he good with accounting, nor with the production of lithographs themselves. But including his sister in his art business opened new problems for him. All his life, his relationships had been formed around those with whom he shared a common interest. In terms of general relationships, Ryman found that as he aged, he lacked the ability to confront people directly. He was a pacifist, an observer, a person most at home in his own studio. The power between himself and others now often favored those other people. Nowhere was this more true than with his sisters, a shift in control that developed in the years after Cora's passing. Uh, when his mother died, Disney designer Alice Davis explained, Ryman was dominated by his sisters. Some of his friends went so far to say that Lucille controlled his work, where it was shown and how it was sold. Uh, what I didn't like was that he wouldn't stand up to his sisters, explained Seal Burroughs, who worked at Disney as a secretary. I didn't like that, the lack of strength. As Ryman's lithographs became collectibles, Lucille grew more interested in his work, not so much in terms of its artistic merit, but in terms of its sales value. At times, Ryman would complain about this power imbalance in his family. One day, when showing a friend a sketch he had made years earlier for Pirates of the Caribbean, an image of a skeletal pirate reclining in a stately bed surrounded by useless treasure, Ryman touched the pirate with his finger. That's Lucille, he said with a knowing half-comic smile. Ryman would never confront his sisters, particularly Lucille. When he was with them, he was returned, through forces he didn't fully understand, to his childhood role, that of the younger brother, the sickly but brilliant artist who needed to be protected. He likely realized that he needed Lucille's help to manage the business of being a painter, one who now sold prints and small books that reproduced his work. But among friends, he quietly complained that his relationship with Lucille at times now overwhelmed him. During this period, from 1971 to 1974, Ryman worked primarily as a solo painter. During these same years, WED managers searched for a new direction that would lead them into the future, a future they had trouble imagining because senior designers kept second-guessing themselves and wondering what would Walt do, a question that no one could definitively answer. 
This paralysis might be best seen in the lack of attractions produced by Wed. During Walt's lifetime, Wed produced new attractions most every year, either for Disneyland or for the New York World's Fair. But from 1971 through the start of 1974, Wed produced hardly anything for the Disney parks. At Disneyland, Wed opened an exhibit called The Walt Disney Story that presented the life of its founder through photos, art, and film. It also cloned Country Bear Jamboree, an attraction already open in Florida for Disneyland. In Florida, Wed added Tom Sawyer's Island and Pirates of the Caribbean both in 1973. That is over three years, and with two parks, it produced only four attractions, three of them being little more than adaptations of attractions that already existed at the other Disney park. Wed spent these years exploring ways to expand the Florida resort using elements of Walt's old master plan. One proposal was to create a set of international pavilions and a shopping district near the Transportation and Ticket Center, similar to the international shopping area that Walt had once envisioned for his city. As Wed designers conceptualized it, this international village was not a theme park so much as it was an open retail and dining space that people could visit without a ticket. Another idea was to develop a residential area toward the end of the Disney property near Lake Buena Vista. Neither project was fully realized. Only in the mid-1970s did Wed finally alight on a plan that would better develop the Florida resort, largely by focusing on new amusement areas rather than on projects that had been part of Walt's original vision. In 1975, Disney World opened the People Mover in Tomorrowland, an updated version of the one installed eight years earlier in California. It also opened Space Mountain, which was a ride originally proposed for the 1967 new Tomorrowland project in California. Lastly, Disney built a new circular theater and moved the Carousel of Progress from California to Florida. In terms of larger projects, Wed pivoted away from a planned community in Florida and focused instead on two new parks. One park, eventually to be called Epcot Center, would combine pavilions focused on near-future technology with an international village. The other park, the first to be built overseas, would eventually be called Tokyo Disneyland. By the end of 1975, whatever jealousies or animosities that once swirled around Wed as Disney World opened in 1971 had died down. Though some there had once resented Ryman for being one of Walt's favorites, many at Wed were now looking for ways to tie the company closer to the identity of their departed leader. With this, there was now a path for many key artists who had been laid off to return. In this group were not only Ryman, but also the songwriting team of Dick and Bob Sherman, animator Ward Kimball, and designer Rolly Crump. In large part, their return was possible because John Hench and Marty Scalar had solidified a new power structure at WED, one that had existed long enough now so that it couldn't be challenged by those who had been close to Walt. Ryman was invited to return at the end of 1975 into a role where he would be an esteemed artist. He would not be in line for a managerial position. Rather, he would be part of the living tissue that connected Wed back to Walt, a connection that was becoming more important as Wed bulked up its ranks with younger artists, those who generally admired Walt but had never met him. Ryman was initially assigned to the Tokyo Project, 
For some it wed, it was unthinkable not to include Herbie in the designs of a new castle park, as he had been a lead designer for the two that existed. Ryman, in addition to producing unusually effective paintings, could also present the thoughts and perspectives of Walt to a new generation of designers. Officially, Ryman was called a senior consultant. He said that he was surprised and delighted to return. In ways, the Ryman who returned was different than the Ryman who had been laid off in the summer of 1971. He valued Wed in a new way, as he saw this set of buildings as his true artistic home. Some of his greatest skills, those he and other artists had used to design realistic backlot sets, were now more commonly used in the construction of theme parks than they were in the expansion of studio backlots. Ryman had lived long enough to see the center of his original field shift from studios to parks. Wed, he knew, was one of the few places that still valued the unique skills he had developed over the past six decades. In this, the return to Wed was a comfort, a sense of a familiar world coming down around him once more. Younger artists noticed that Herbie was different from many others who had once worked with Walt. Though some of the old-timers held grudges, Herbie, for the most part, didn't. Designer Steve Kirk, a young man also hired in 1976, said, Herbie didn't have the darkness the others seemed to have. Model maker Harvey Mayo explained, Herbie wasn't like some of the people in the upper echelons who had a don't bother me kid, I'm working attitude. He would remove himself from a certain plateau and put himself on your level, sincerely without patronizing. From the start, Herbie warmed to this new role, which might be described both as master painter and ambassador of Walt's legacy. He offered newly hired artists advice, many of whom were 40 or more years younger than him. To Doug Leffler, a storyboard artist, he said, If you know how to dream, you can paint, you can do anything. Eddie Martinez explained that Herb always liked to talk about the past and today and the future, and he'd take out books and show you articles because a lot of people are always dwelling on what happened yesterday, and he always let me feel that history is happening right now. On Wednesday evenings when Wed held life drawing classes, Ryman occasionally attended to see what the younger artists were producing. Herbie was always busting around, helping everyone out. Chris Ronco recalled. One night, Ryman looked at Ronco's drawings, his eyes widening with admiration. Uh, that's what I like, Herbie said, no gimmicks. When Ryman thought that the younger artists were cutting corners, he told them half-joking, remember, bad taste cost no more, which was his way of encouraging them to put more effort into their work. In this way, Wed became the center of his community. Ryman now possessed something he had wanted for years, a group of people who admired his abilities and his accomplishments. This, in ways, was what he had hoped to find in gallery shows and museums, an audience who respected his talent and understood what he was trying to communicate through his art. For Ryman, his life at Wed was more comfortable than family life with his sisters. Nina Ravon, a special effects designer, explained, Everybody used his work as inspiration. We'd get a print of one of his old paintings, put it on the board, something to inspire us. Another Disney artist, Alex Taylor, said, Herbie was definitely a mentor. He had had his Disney life, and then he had his own work that he kept separate. He had conscience and such humility, not a power monger, not a threat to anyone. In this way, stripped of some of the power he'd enjoyed while Walt was alive, Ryman found a new life for himself, one in which he quietly became one center of a small industry.
though he had been hired to develop Tokyo Disneyland shortly after arriving, he learned that Disney was developing a second park in Florida. In part, Epcot Center was an expression of Walt's ideas about the future, how technology had the ability to improve the lives of average people and transform cities throughout the world. Ryman was drawn to this project in that at its center were concepts that Walt had loved during his final years. But the technology pavilions were only half of this unique park. The other half was a presentation of international cities, much like those Ryman had seen at the New York World's Fair two decades ago. The international village was called World Showcase. Around a lagoon, Disney planned to recreate aspects of France, Mexico, the UK, China, and many other countries once formal deals were signed. Ryman sensed that this was an ideal project for him. At MGM, he had created highly detailed sets to represent France and London. At Fox, he had created sets that represented China. At these studios, he had specialized in sketching research-centered realistic images of foreign locations that would then be built as full-sized sets. This, in Ryman's mind, was a project for which he was uniquely suited, transitioning his international designs to create the architecture and open spaces of World Showcase. He sensed that this would be one of the last times in his life where he would be able to use these skills, recreating one part of the world through his art that would be then constructed in open space around him. By the start of 1977, Ryman was not only a senior consultant to Tokyo Disneyland, he was a senior consultant to Epcot Center where his abilities were often directed at World Showcase. A perfect project for Ryman, now that he was back in the business of designing theme parks. I'll be back next week with a new episode. As you know, we're an ad-free, listener-supported podcast. We do just two things. Deep dives on stories related to the history of the Disney studio and the parks, and news and analysis of current events as they relate to the Disney company. We are funded entirely by listener contributions, specifically by listeners who join us on Bandcamp as monthly supporters. On Bandcamp, you'll find over 200 episodes not available on iTunes or anywhere else. But the best reason to join us there is to support the work we do and to make sure that this podcast continues to exist. You can become a monthly supporter at dhipodcast.bandcamp.com. I'll leave a link down in the show notes. Until then, this is Todd James Pierce.